Welcome to the online worship service of Swiss Home Park Primitive Methodist Church. We hope you are blessed by everything you see and hear today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Our reading this morning will be from 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 22. You'll find them on uh, page 673 in your hymn or in your pew uh, Bible. So it would be 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 22. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by name, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom, as I have covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name. I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all people. And as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this thus to this land and this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this calamity on them. So I got a question for you. Who remembers what last week's message was about? Humility. Is, I think that's what we have here. You know, I guess it works better if you turn this on, okay? And yeah, it's going to come. Okay, Krista, I might need your help there, hon. But the reality is, as, as Krista makes that roll, here's the question. Now think about this before you answer it. Who this past week can say they just hit it out of the park when it came to demonstrating a spirit of humility? Yeah, be careful with that, okay? Just to say, yeah, this week I, I, I was humble, okay? And, and everyone knew it. I mean, everywhere I went, they said, oh, aren't you just the spirit of humility? Well, if that's the case, we need to go back. You, you may have a better chance of running the bases for the Pirates, okay? Uh, you know, Janice and I were talking earlier about uh, some things with, with baseball, and one of the things that you have to... Uh, understand as far as a, a player for the Pirates is that first base is, is overrated. Okay, So first base as a uh, defensive means, if, if the ball is thrown to you, you just need to do what? Step on it. Remember, that wasn't able to happen. And then if you hit a home run, what's another thing essential as you run around the bases and touch home and think you hit a home run? You have to touch them all. You have to touch first base as well. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's quite, quite a process. But anyway, humility. Well, what do you think the, the subject's going to be today? What do you think it's going to be today? 
Because see, that's why we're taking the survey. We last week had Yana read, and, and now today Bill read. And so remember what he said after humility. It's up back here. Okay, babe. So <laughs> here, here's the reality. Here's the reality. Solomon was being spoken to by God. And Solomon was told by God, look, what if I do what? Shut up heaven. And what if in that whole process, what happens? There's all these things that happen upon the, your land, throughout the land. And we get to a place where what occurs? You're up against the wall. What are you going to do when all the storms of life and the opposition are just in your face? Last week, the first thing that God said to Solomon that you guys need to remember is be humble. Be humble and don't let pride and don't let the things of yourself do what? Overtake you. And now today, we consider the next part of what he said to Solomon is to pray. So let me ask you straight up today, what is, how can you define the word prayer? What is prayer? Try that again. A conversation with God. What did you say, Jan? Talking with God. What else? He does. But that's not part of the process. Part of the process in prayer is back to this whole point. It's a communication. It's a conversation. Because in that process, what is prayer? If it's a conversation, what does that mean? I'm speaking, but you're speaking to me. You see, it's, it's, it's not just this, please, please, please. But through our prayer, how much do we spend as far as time listening to him? You ever have a conversation with someone and they're the only one that talks? That's not a conversation. That's what? That's like going to school. That's a dissertation. That's a lecture. That's let me tell you this. And at the end of the day, you're kind of like, huh? Right? Huh? Prayer shouldn't be that way. And, and, and so when we consider these things today, prayer is, is the way we communicate. It's the way we talk to God. And that conversation could and should center around the part of what? Praising Him, honoring Him, telling how God how much we love Him. How do you pray? You read in the response of reading, there's ways to pray and there's ways not to pray. And one of the ways not to pray is what? To be on the street corner and saying, listen to me. Everybody, and oh God, you can get on this too if you want, but I'm, more important, it's for me if everyone else hears it, okay? Remember the movie where the lady went to her closet, war room, and would pray? Okay, the reality of what was going on in life, we can pray in an open voice, we can pray silently, we can pray in public, we can pray in our closet. Scripture is filled from beginning to the end of examples with people, beautiful examples of people who've been crying out to the Lord, who've been asking for strength, asking for guidance, asking for healing. Thank you, Krista, asking for restoration and knowing and understanding that it all centers around the concept of communicating with God. Let me ask you these just simple foundational points when it comes to prayer, if we understand how they play a vital part in this communication. When I pray, do I come to God with the understanding that I come praying and asking this in the name of Jesus? Because Jesus is the one that allowed me to have this privilege and connection with him. Do I pray in faith believing? Do I pray in the might of the Holy Spirit? Do I pray feeling and believing in God's favor? Praying as my soul is emptied out and cries out to God. Do I draw near to Him? Do I kneel before Him in holy reverence and adoration in this conversation? 
You see, prayer, as God was telling Solomon, humility is critical because in that part, what has happened? You've removed all the pride out of yourself, and now I, I, I'm before the presence of God, hinging upon every word, every thought, everything that He gives me through His Word and through His Spirit to communicate and demonstrate His power and presence and purpose in my life. And that's why God was telling Solomon, what if heaven was shut up right now? What are you going to do? Because you have circumstances right now in your life, and you're saying, hey, this is what's at my door right now. This is what the people at work are doing. This is what the kids at school are doing. This is what my family's doing. And I feel all these things. What are you going to do? You're going to start blaming people? You're going to start keeping score? You're going to start doing this, doing that? God told Solomon, keep your pride out of the way. And allow my will to be front and center. Now get on your face and call upon me in that spirit of prayer. What was one of the things that Jesus was so upset with when, when, when he was seeing what happened in Jerusalem on the triumphal entry? They took the house of prayer and did what? Turned it into a den of thieves. Think about this church and think about our lives and think about the body of Christ here and all around the world. God told Solomon, when people walk by this place, if you, if you don't do it right, I'm going to shut it down. And people are going to say, what happened there? And they're going to say, that's the place where the people thought more of themselves than upon relying upon the presence and power of God in their life. When people walk by this church, what do they see? When people see you and me, when people see this church on, the, on social media, what do they see? What do they understand? After everything all settles, do they see it as a house of prayer? When they see you and me, do they see us as a people of prayer? If my people who are called by my name would simply humble themselves and then pray. Think about how prayer becomes such a different dynamic when pride is removed from the communication. Picture how that becomes a different conversation with someone when they take their pride out of that conversation. And so many times when we call upon God, if our conversation is laced upon how wonderful I am and how, God, you've missed many opportunities. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. A house of prayer. A people of prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 simply calls us to do what? To pray without ceasing. So we have a question for you right now. And, and, and don't answer this out loud, okay? How often do you pray? How often do you pray? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. And pray without ceasing. Just as our lives, as Paul called the Roman church to know and understand, that our lives should be, a, should be a continual act of worship. Not just when we're here at church or listening to something on the radio or sitting and watching something on television and we get caught up in that understanding of, of exalting God. But 24-7, our lives should be that of worship and what? And prayer. Because prayer is what? Communicating with God. I, I, statistics can be anything. It's just like Wikipedia. Wikipedia can say anything you want it to say, and you'll think it's the whole truth. So I preface this with that foundation. Guess what 3.2 billion people are active in every day? Besides eating and breathing. Over 3.2 billion people a day are on social media. 
3.2 billion people. And can you believe that our website and that our YouTube link and these opportunities from our Facebook page, it's at the disposal of 3.2 billion people. Like that. Isn't that amazing? Where are you going with this, Dennis? Well, with social media, they can track and they can see what people do. We get a report every month as far as how many people watch the YouTube channel and how much they spend per view watching the channel here at church. Not faith and family, but just on YouTube every month. Here's your report, and then they want to sell you more things to enhance your exposure and coverage upon the social media. But this blew me away. 3.2 billion people on social media every day. And guess what happens for two hours and 24 minutes a day from everyone on Facebook? That's exactly right. They're on Facebook for two hours and 24 minutes a day. They're an average consumer on Facebook. Two hours and 24 minutes a day, people are consumed in Facebook. Social media across the board, the average is 2.33, two hours and 33 minutes a day they just spend on social media alone. Across the board, but specifically on Facebook, it's the highest platform as far as social media. Two hours and 24 minutes a day is what the person spends average on Facebook. How often do I pray? Do you believe in prayer? According to Barna, good Christian uh, stats group, the adults in America, 79% of the adults in America has prayed at least once in the last three months. Wow. According to Barna, Barna, 82% of those people who say they pray, they pray silently. They don't pray in public. They don't pray openly. They pray silently. Of those 79% who, who pray, 62% of that group that prays, 62% of that group do nothing but thank God and give him praise for blessings in their life. Of that group, 47% of the people that pray would ask for issues pertaining to health. And of that group that prays, 43% of that group would ever spend any time in the areas of confession and repentance. But as across the board, when you think of 79% of adults in America say that at least in the last three months they prayed at least once. Do you believe in prayer? What would be your statistic today? What do you spend the most time in through the course of a day throughout the week when you see what occupies and centers and calls for your attention? Solomon was being reminded, look, you guys have a good thing going here. This temple is amazing. You just had an eight-day celebration. It's phenomenal. And all the things that can happen to exalt the kingdom and bless the lives of people, remember, stay humble. Remember to pray. So how often do I pray? Do I even believe in prayer? I want to share a couple quick things with you that may help us in our discovery as we learn more about truly what prayer is. And the first thing after we ask the question, do I believe, I want to share this thought with you. First of all, don't worry. What's the next part? Be happy. Do, 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 do. Don't worry. Be happy. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. What does Paul say? Don't be anxious about anything. How many things today, if we're going to be brutally honest, and you could begin to write this down, you worry about? 
And why is it wrong to worry? Because we're saying that that thing in front of us is greater than God. We're saying that thing in front of us has overwhelmed the power and presence of God in our life. And if we're going to pray effectively and efficiently and according to the promise of his word, we need to, what would be the phrase? Worry about nothing and pray about everything. Don't worry. Don't be anxious for anything in your life. And as, as Paul made that charge to the, to the church at Philippi, listen as he continues. He said, But by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now look what happens when that's carried out. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Is it safe to say today there's a lot of people losing their minds? There's a lot of people today just upset and coming unraveled and coming unglued in whatever other way you want to describe it. And Paul, or God was telling Solomon, look, to keep everything straight and right in your life, stay humble and pray. And Paul says, as you do these things, do it with a mind of understanding his potential and promise in my life. And don't worry, but trust him. So if I'm going to be the things that God wants for me to be in my life as I call upon him through prayer, I need to learn, first of all, not to be anxious, not to worry, not to have that, that understanding that, that something's going to explode and blow up. And I'm always on pins and needles. But I'm resting confident in his presence and power in my life. Again, I don't know what might be at your door. I don't know what might be looking at you every day. I don't know what Goliath might be taunting your world and telling you that, that he's bigger and greater than God could ever be. And so Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. But what's he say to do? Know and understand today how the prayer of what? A righteous person is effective. Now, where does that come from? It comes from the Bible. It comes from James chapter 5. And remember the story in James chapter 5 when, when, when James writes this. Where does this come from? We always say the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? It avails much. And we stop there. Well, who's the righteous guy that they're talking about here? Elijah. Remember what was going on with Elijah? He told, if you go back in 1 Kings chapter 17, he told Ahab something. And you know what he told him? Because of what Israel was doing in this worship thing with Baal, it's not going to rain for a few years. That's a pretty bold step. So guess what happened? It didn't rain. Three and a half years later, what happens? There's this big encounter, and Elijah, he defeats the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. It's done. Now we're fast-forwarding through the story, but Elijah tells Ahab something now. What's he say? It's going to rain. That's a pretty bold step. What did Elijah do? And I'm not going to try to do it. I might fall over, but he went to the top of Mount Carmel, and the Bible says he bent over and he put his head between his legs. I'd be like, oh, but anyway. And that's what he did. And he prayed and he believed for this to happen and it hadn't rained. And, and so he offered that prayer. And what did he say to his servant? Go look and see. The servant comes back and says, no rain. Let me try it. Yeah, try that at home. Seven times he did that. Seven times, and then the word says, about the size of a fist, there was this cloud that formed up out of the sea. And it began to grow and fester. And what began to happen? Oh, the rains came down. That's where James chapter 5 comes from, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous individual. Because when you read on, 
you know what it says about this guy? Everybody thinks, oh, I, I, I can't do what Elijah did. I can't do that. Well, my question is, why not? Because verse 17 says, Elijah was a man subject to passions just as you and I are. Meaning, he was an ordinary guy like you and me. But what else does it say? But he prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't rain on the earth for the space of three years and six months. <coughs> Excuse me, and then he prayed again. And the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Elijah was a normal guy like you and me, and God used him. Why? Because the prayer of a righteous person is very effective. You can do so many things in the world today. <coughs> Excuse me, through prayer. Well, that's what the preacher's for. I'll call Cornerstone and get on the prayer line. We have WhatsApp. Someone asked me one day, well, what's the app we have? I said, you just said it, WhatsApp. But anyway, they said, oh, okay. But do you believe that today for you? Do you believe you have the same spirit and resolve and ability as Elijah to have what? an effect upon the world that we live in today. We're not begging, we're imploring, we're believing with an earnest heart as we communicate with God, and God demonstrates back to us His will <coughs> through His voice and by His Spirit of His purpose and plan. The prayer of a righteous individual. It's powerful. It's forceful, and it's effective. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe your prayer is effective? Do you believe as you pray and as you believe, as you trust and honor the power and presence of God through this opportunity of communicating and talking to Him, that this prayer can be effective? I want to believe the answer is yes from each of you. Because that's part of why we do what we do on Sunday, and we hear, and we listen, and we share. And it's not just me, but it's each one of you praying and believing, and not just here, but throughout the week, that I can make a difference in the life, in a family, in a job, in a school, in our world today, where violence and all these things are happening. Someone like me, just like Elijah, can be earnest in my spirit and say, God, hear me, as I cry out to you. God puts his arm around you and says, be of good cheer and know and understand that my son overcame the world and through this, glory is going to be brought to the kingdom of God. Friends, that's what God was telling Solomon when he said, what if heaven gets shut up? What are you going to do? That Goliath, that circumstance that you're looking at in your life, what are you going to do about it? I can be like Elijah and I, could, I can do that. I can pray, I can believe and know God's purpose and plan through these things. How often do I pray? I need to pray a whole lot more, folks. How effective is my prayer? I need to be a whole lot more effective. We don't have to look far around the church and through the community and around this land to see that there are things that need praying for. But it first has to start within our hearts and see where we are to be effective and efficient to reach and touch the world. One last thing. Be thankful. When we walk into prayer with an attitude, God, you owe me. God, you better. That's all laced with pride. That's all laced with arrogance and a condescending spirit that just is not what prayer is all about. Are we truly thankful for 
what we have and who we are. And for the privilege that God has given us today at this time to serve and honor Him. I don't know if many of you saw this the other night, but I saw it and it just blew me away. A 30-year-old woman named Jane McChefsky, okay? She appeared on American Idol. And she walked out. And I understand she's a Liberty grad, right, Krista? Pardon me? Or America's Got Talent, that's right. What did I say, American Idol? So she walks out on the stage, and they're talking to her. Bottom line is she's 30 years old. And she said, as they just talked with her, that she only has a 2% chance of surviving cancer. Then she reminded everyone that 2% is not zero. She talked about the cancer that was in her spine and in her liver. And here's what she said. She said, it's important that everyone knows that I'm, not, that I'm so much more than the bad things that happened to me. I'm so much more than the bad things that happened to me. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. Here's a girl who's walking out grateful that she can breathe and isn't wanting to focus upon these things, but just to be grateful. And I'm thinking, oh my word, am I truly thankful? So I did a little more research on her. And she talks about the struggles that she's been through in life because of, of cancer. She realized one day that the person who told her she loved her, he didn't want to be married to her anymore, lost that relationship. And then she goes on to say this. I remind myself that I'm praying to the God who let the Israelites stay lost for decades. They begged to arrive in the promised land, but instead he let them wander. Answering prayers they didn't pray. For 40 years, their shoes didn't wear out. Fire lit their path each night. And every morning, he sent them mercy bread from heaven. She said, I look hard for the answers to prayers that I didn't pray. I look for the mercy bread that he promised to bake fresh for me each morning. The Israelites called it manna. And you know what that is translated. What is it? The same question I'm asking again and again and again. There's mercy here somewhere, but what is it? What is it? What is it? But here's from a thankful heart. She says, I see mercy in the dusty sunlight that outlines the trees in my mother's crooked hands. In the blanket my friend left for me, in the harmony of the wind chimes. It's not the mercy that I asked for, but it's mercy nonetheless. And then she says this, and I learned a new prayer. Thank you. It's a prayer I don't mean yet, but will repeat it until I do. <coughs> Call me cursed. Call me lost. Call me scorned. But that's not all. Call me chosen, blessed, sought after. Call me the one who God whispers his secrets to. I'm the one whose belly is filled with the loaves of mercy that were hidden for me. You see, many times in our life we predicate upon this thing of prayer. Did I get what I want? It's almost like taking a list of Santa Claus. I didn't get that. 
you'll shoot your eye out, kid, and he pushes us down the step, or the slide, I don't know. But where's our heart today of thanksgiving? And to know the one who I call on will provide the things necessary to glorify him through the circumstance that has perplexed me and this 30-year-old woman standing there. It was so moving to the point that the brick wall, Simon Cowell, was so touched, he stood up, and if you're familiar with America's Got Talent, he hit the golden button, and she was advanced to the finale. That's real stuff. So when people see the church, when people see you, when people see me, do they see someone who, who in their heart isn't overwhelmed and not anxious, but believing and trusting God and knowing and understanding in the midst of these things that by petition and prayer, because the next part of, of that verse calls us to be what? Thankful. Do they see that? And do I see that? And it's not predicated upon what I think it should be because Israel, 40 years wandering, their shoes never wore out. What do we take for granted at times? And it's only because of the hand of God that we have it. I tell people the story of this church of how, for how long was it, Ron, in the trustee meeting, we're praying, Lord, what do we do about the roof and different things happening here? And then all of a sudden, what happens? We get a whole new roof and the church is sided and didn't cost us a dime except for the extra things that we did. Is that a fair way to say it? God does things in ways beyond our wildest imaginations if we can just stay humble and not be anxious, but by prayer and petition with a thankful heart, know that he's in control and this is going to work out and my heart will be forever grateful. Yeah, they've told me 2%. Not good number, is it? I don't know what your number is today. But friends, I'm sure it's not zero. I want to encourage you today to begin to write some things down that you need to be more focused upon praying for yourself, for your family, for your relationships, for your home, for your school, for your church, for your community, for this nation. Not being anxious but by prayer and petition with a thankful heart. And have that communication with God. Watch what happens in your prayer life. Watch what happens and how God manifests clearly to you things that will just astonish you. If my people who are called by my name would remain humble and pray. Watch what happens. We'll continue next week with the next part of this. But my challenge for you today is visit humility and know and understand that it has no place in the will of God. Or pride, know that it has no place in the will of God. And understand the essential component of prayer. And watch what God does. Please pray with me. Father, we love you and we praise you for Jesus. And we pray more than ever that we could pray more than ever. And not with desperation, but in a conversation, in an exchange with you. And you walk with us and you talk with us and you tell me that we're yours. And the joy that we share as we tarry there, no one else has ever known. May that be a descriptive of our prayer life. Today would be possibly the day that someone would say, I need Jesus in my heart. I need Jesus to be my Savior and Lord. May just now they accept and believe by faith the promise of, of, of your word. Maybe today's the day we're saying, I, I need to, to, to get back into the understanding of what prayer means and, and to rightfully uphold it in my life. I need to extinguish the pride that's been keeping me from the things that you want. Wherever we are today, as we sing in closing, may we at a pew or at the altar find our peace and rest with you 
as we pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. For more information on how to stay connected, go to www.swisshomeparkpmchurch.com. God bless you.